So, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this conference. I'm very honored and happy to be here. It's been a fantastic couple of days. I think what I'm gonna talk about uh, this morning is I'm gonna touch and elaborate on some of the things that were already discussed by several of the presenters today. I'm gonna show some examples about what this means. I'm gonna focus first on the data layer and what does it mean to liberate data and what does it mean to access data, but I'm gonna try and keep this in perspective of the geoscientist. What does it mean for the geoscientist? How do they access this? How do they make that part of their workflow? And how do they start to transform their way they're working? So I just wanted to start with a little bit of background first, a little bit of historical step back and talk about the promise of digital. It is almost impossible to open up a LinkedIn or a journal or come to an event like this and not talk about digital anymore. It is clearly something that is impacting our industry in a massive way. And you can really see why when you look at some of the numbers that we're talking about here. We're really talking about massive numbers in the t hundreds of billions of dollars of potential savings that we could be making across our industry as we start to implement some of these digital technologies and bring them into the way we're working. Of course, when we talk about digital, it's not one thing. So it's very easy to talk about digital transformation and digitization, but really it's an ecosystem of different technologies. At the heart of this is the cloud. I think it was mentioned earlier in the AWS presentation that the cloud is really the big enabler that is transforming the way we work. It seems only a couple of years ago that when we were going around and talking to clients around what their strategy is around digital, some people were set on the fence around whether they were gonna go cloud or not cloud. Increasingly, this conversation does not happen anymore. The premise that we're facing when we, when we talk to most of the clients, especially in North America and Europe and in other Asias, is just by default that they expect that they're gonna be working in the cloud in oil and gas over the next few years. But there's many other things you need to consider. We need to consider security. Security is a key aspect of that. As we think about how we're gonna build data, put data into the cloud, access the technologies, how do we ensure we can protect security and maintain that level of security that we've been looking at is critical. We need to think about IoT, connected devices, edge analytics, how does the data, real-time data stream into here? How do we put automation into our process? Then we can think about once we're bringing everything together in the data, how do we enable machine learning, artificial intelligence, analytics on top of it? And also we have to think about the design. When we think about the geoscientist of the future, how do they want to interact with their applications? It's not going to be in the same way that we grew up inside of here. It's not going to be a linear task-based approach. It's going to be very much learning about how do you look at outcomes, how do you look at interaction with technology and leverage what you have accessible to you to work? So you have to look at all of these things when you're thinking about digital and digitalization of oil and gas. There's also a very important thing that we need to think about. I think if we're gonna be really looking at that step change of the way we work, that 10X change of changing our processes and our practices to be more efficient, yes, digital, technology is gonna have a major play. Analytics, machine learning, all of these are critically important steps in, the, in technologies to enable our work, but really the domain is still at the heart of everything we do. Digital on its own is not enough. The role of the geoscientist, the understanding of geology, sequence stratigraphy, physics, fluid dynamics, all of this is critically important if we're really gonna marry these two things. Marry this domain understanding, this understanding of geology, understanding of physics, understanding of process, to really start to build the next generation of solutions that leverage digital technologies. So very much we, we're looking in Slumberjay is how do we bring this together? How do we bring the domain knowledge that we have, the processes, the 30 years of building EMP software, marry it together with digital technologies so we can help our clients achieve their goals of digital transformation. So I'm gonna talk really about these four topics, and many of these have been touched already throughout the day. The first one is around data liberation and consumption. Uh, this is a really important topic. If we're really gonna enable new ways to work, it is absolutely critical that we take the data and the engines 
that we have today locked away in these multiple of different applications across the industry, pull that out, liberate that, and make it accessible, and then make it open by putting an API on it so that anything can run against that and call it, and so we can foster this uh, spirit of innovation inside of it. I'm gonna talk a little bit about outcome-driven software design. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how do we move away from a task-driven software to thinking about building software that's focused on delivering an outcome and an impact on the business. I'm gonna talk about collaboration. I'm gonna talk a bit about how do we collaborate as an industry around the data, but also how do, what have we seen change over the last few years? We have seen a lot of different levels of collaboration from the way service companies are engaging with horizontal IT players and engaging with operators to build the next generation and build this step change inside of the industry. And then I'm gonna talk about what kind of skills does a geoscientist need? Or what should we be looking at? And I think this will hopefully set us up for the next session of what do we expect that role to uh, encompass inside of oil and gas as we move forward. So let me start talking about data liberation. It's pretty simple as a concept really that most people go to school as a geologist or a geophysicist or a petroleum engineer. They tend to go, they work for an operator, they discover a challenge and they build an application. So you may build an application that works as a geophysics application or a geology application. As soon as you bring the data inside of there, you're putting that into the binary application. You're locking that data inside of that application so that you can work with that data, be efficient, and get results inside of the application. Of course, there's not only one domain, there's not only one geologist, so over time, we develop other tools for structural geology, for petrophysics, for modeling inside of here. We start to think about how do we integrate those together. The first step was around building structured databases. How do I build table-based uh, databases where the data that's inside of these applications can come together to be operational and share? We then started to think about uh, how do we generate reports? What do we do? We, we have paper reports, we have presentations we write, that we have lots of information that's sat in what we refer to as unstructured data. And increasingly, we're getting more and more information coming from the rig site. As we think about what we're doing, not just with real-time information coming from drilling and operations, but as we put more and more sensors on the rigs, on the valves, this flood of information that's coming into this, there's this wave of information that's coming and knowledge inside of this. And of course, over the last 20 years, this has massively expanded. It is not uncommon when I visit oil and gas companies and look at the number of software applications they have, they can have over 200 applications just in the geoscience space today with all of the data sat individually in the binary formats of each of those applications. So a few years ago, as people started moving to the cloud, the technology seemed to be there which was allowing us to address this. So people started talking about data lakes they started about this, talking about this ability to take data, pull it from multiple different sources, put it into a data lake technology so that we could start to liberate the data, put it in there, make it accessible to everyone inside of it. The challenge that people started to, to face instantly, so Slumberjay started building its data lake in 2014, for example. It's one of the first projects we set up in our research center in Silicon Valley. We started to realize that data lake technology on its own was not enough for oil and gas. It wasn't gonna be operational uh, to, to do the interaction that we needed to do. It didn't really scale in the way we wanted to manage seismic data and lots of well data inside of it. Several other companies that started to build their own data lakes and data ecosystems started to come to the same conclusion. And we also realized that if we all just build our own data lake, if we all just build our own data ecosystem, we do not solve the challenges around data liberation and collaboration, because we're gonna end up with a whole series of different lakes that don't talk to each other with their own APIs on it that everyone needs to share, ingest, run inside of this. So really what the industry is starting to come to the conclusion of is what we need to think about is we need to think about a data ecosystem. We need to think about this concept of having this environment where we can ingest data from multiple sources. We can bring it in from all of the national repositories around the world, ingest it, visualize it into a common uh, things. We can bring structured, unstructured data, reports, 
sensor information, uh, uh, project information inside of it. And critically, we can take the application data that sat in those hundreds of different applications today and liberate that data out and store it into a data ecosystem. So for Slumberjay, we started building this data ecosystem uh, in 2014, and it is this reference architecture that we open sourced and we contributed to the OSDU because we wanted to make sure that the community could come to one standard, one body that was looking at how does data, is data managed and stored inside of the cloud so we didn't end up with this duplication of different data inside of here. Data ecosystem is fantastic technology. Effectively, you have an API at the bottom on ingestion. The concept is you can bring in all of the metadata. Everything comes in so that you can track the lineage, you can track how it works inside of here so you can really start to enable it. And then you have an API on consumption. It's a public API, an open API, which means that any application that sits on top can do this. But it wasn't just about the liberation of data. You really need to think about the liberation of engines. So in the current suite of applications, there's a huge amount of physics and geology around the compute for seismic attributes, for petrophysical modeling, for simulation. We want to make sure we liberate those engines outside of the applications and store them in the cloud as well so they can also be called by APIs so that you can run this today. So it's this type of data ecosystem that is really going to transform the way we share data inside of uh, the industry, and it's why we're, we're so happy to contribute to the OSDU to ensure that the, the industry moves together as a standards on top of this. And it's why the big focus for us in Slumberjay now is about building out that data ecosystem, but also liberating the data and engines out of our current applications. It is critical that this is open. So open in two ways. One is open source the donation of the source code so the community can develop. But the other one is open APIs, making sure the schema is published, the API is published, so any software company, any oil and gas company can build directly on top of this solution. Uh, we do this so we can enable several things. So today we're already putting in, well, it's Lumberjay's own internal data ecosystem, we have about 350 million data items in it. We embed analytics directly on top of all that data that's ingested into the data ecosystem so we can find anything in context. It means as a geologist or a geoscientist, increasingly you're not just looking for well information or seismic information, you're going to look for drilling information, production information, uh, information coming from sensors in the oil field and try and correlate and understand what does that mean for me as a geologist or a geophysicist inside the industry without having to search for everything because it's already instantly accessible to you in the data ecosystem. And then you can start to build dashboards and analytics on top of here so you can decide. Increasingly, we're gonna see the high performance compute in the cloud enable us to run these multiple realizations to run background simulation and then we'll, we'll be actually looking at how do we look at all those different ensembles and models and make decisions on it. So I'm gonna show you a couple of things in here. So the first one is actually just the, the data ecosystem that we spun up for our forum uh, last week. We have a map canvas that we put on top of it so we can visualize uh, today. This forum tenant we spun up had about 50 million data items in it, coming from several hundred different data sources, all ingested into the data ecosystem, visualized in a map, we embed, actually this is Spotfire analytics sat on top of it so that we can see everything we can have in here. All of the different sources we loaded up, completions, production, production, uh, records, structured, unstructured data. We can even start to think about how do we liberate metadata from projects and put that in so we can find that. So the kind of information that you can store inside of here, so in this example I'm just looking in and looking at all the patrol projects in this case that have been liberated into the data ecosystem. We can also then start to do visual analytics on type of this. So in this case, we've put all of our prospect inventory into the data ecosystem, and we can start to interrogate that, rank this, understand the risks, and start to see how do we make decisions on top of this. It also starts to encourage data science for everyone inside of here. By making it an open system, 
by putting open standards inside of here, we're allowing data scientists to come in, use Python and R scripting to build their own solutions, customize, build their own dashboards, add their own insights to the data that's liberated inside of this across E, D, and P. And we're also starting to introduce the ability to run machine learning, build your own machine learning and analytics on top of this. And this is what I'm going to focus on a little bit next. So machine learning is a big buzz today. There is a lot of talk about this, a lot of uh, information about how machine learning is going to accelerate our jobs as geoscientists in the industry. But really, when you think about machine learning, you really need to think not just about the machine learning algorithm itself. It's really about three different component parts. You need to think about access to the data. You need to think about the machine learning algorithm and brain itself. And then you also need to think about the geoscientist. You need to think about the UI, the user interface of how they're going to train the data, call the data. One of the big challenges I've seen when I've been visiting clients that are doing machine learning and doing digital projects today is what they did is they formed digital teams. They went off and they actually said, okay, we're going to form this digital team, we're going to do machine learning. They asked their geoscientists to give them the training labels, give them the data, they ingest it into the cloud, they run the machine learning, they get the results. Fantastic as a POC, but when you go back and say, how do your users access it? they can't access it today because they need to provide the labels and provide the data. So if you're going to be effective, you want to think about this three-part component. And actually, if you want to be really effective, uh, you need to think about your current user base. So Johan mentioned it earlier as the legacy applications inside of here. But for Slumberjay today, we have about 50,000 geoscientists using those applications today. We don't want to take them away from the digital transformation. We want them to be part of the journey. So by building the machine learning and putting the data externalized in the data ecosystem, actually we can allow them to simply run the machine learning from their current project where they're already comfortable and working. But because we've externalized, any web native application that we build that also sits on top of the data ecosystem can call exactly the same open architecture. So I'm just gonna show you a quick example of demystifying machine learning. So in this case, I'm looking at an application, a current application. Uh, it's running in the cloud. It's streaming data directly from the data ecosystem or from the OSDU architecture. So it's sat inside of here. There's no longer any need to copy data, move data between projects. So actually, all I need to do is connect up to the data ecosystem, the data screens in. And then very simply, I make a button called machine learning inside of that application. The machine learning is the UI that is going to train the machine to run. So in this case, I'm giving it five different inlines and cross lines, about 2% of your data. I'm giving it a validation line inside of here. In a familiar, comfortable uh, environment for the application where they're already used to, feet to working and they already know how to pick the training data, how to do this, and then they can effectively do this at enterprise and do this at scale. And then I'm simply going to run that. It runs the machine learning algorithm. In this case, I'm looking at one specifically around the structural delineation of faults. Uh, I can train it, retrain it, add more training data, run the multiple iterations. And actually, in this case, we're really getting fantastic results when we train it. It starts with a global brain and then is refined by the user on top of here. So this type of uh, approach is really helping the geoscientist to accelerate. So in this case, I've gone all the way from the data, applying machine learning, extracting the fault patches and building a stru structural model. This took about one day for the interpreter. The clients that we were working with were telling us this was taking about 30 days in the past. And we can bring this all the way down to a day, let the geophysicists, the structural geologists, focus on the hard challenges inside of their familiar application. But because we built it externalized from the application, anyone can run it. Anyone can drop their own machine learning algorithm or build a native web-based application uh, to actually access that same architecture, which is also something else Slumberjay is doing. So when we think about digital transformation, and Johan mentioned it as well, 
The first part is to bring your user inside of there, to take your current applications, enable them in this cloud, liberate the data, liberate the engines, access the data ecosystem inside of there. But ultimately, we want to build web native applications, applications built in a browser so that you can actually run them from anywhere and let that interpreter uh, do their work focused around the task they need to do. So I'm going to give you another quick machine learning example, and I don't have time to take you through the whole thing, but it's the same concept. Inside of the data ecosystem, we've built a wellbore DMS, a man data management service for handling wellbores. It's this architecture, again, that we donated to the OSDU uh, community. We liberate data from our applications into that data ecosystem. We actually run a microservice that when you look at side of that, it runs a log QC, selects the best logs inside of here. We can run some visual analytics to correlate this uh, today. In fact, this, this project was built for North America, so it's about five and a half million wells that we're accessing directly out the, intersect, inter, in, uh, the ecosystem and browsing in top of here. And then we want to use machine learning to rapidly interpret and correlate this. So I'll be very quick. We effectively correlate our wells. It builds a well section for us without duplicating any data. It's reading it out of out the data ecosystem. I have a key well, in this case, a well that has been interpreted. And then simply, I select the algorithm, open to put your own algorithms in there. I select, it's going to go off, and it's going to track and correlate all the markers inside of here, and then it updates the map. The map is actually the same map from Patrol that we externalized and put on an API. Cool. So it's actually running a microservice to load, a machine learning algorithm to correlate, a liberated mapping engine on an API, but it's all focused around the UI. So it's all focused around the user experience. In this case, we sat down with the client, we were trying to solve the challenge they wanted to do. We thought about how do you get access to the data? How do you have a user experience focused around the outcome to correlate and build a map inside of it? So very simple example. You'll see any of these modern web-based applications. The interface is very intuitive, very focused around the task that you want to do. So when you think about how the kind of environments people are building in the cloud as you go forward, absolutely at the base of this, the foundation of this is around the data ecosystem. It was mentioned earlier, this is a real game changer. If we work together as an industry to define those open format, the open standards around this, it really opens up what is possible. We can then think as a geologist or a geophysicist or a petrophysicist or a production engineer or a, a driller, drilling engineer, these outcome-focused domain solutions that sit directly on top of the data ecosystem uh, today. Uh, all of this being open, open source data ecosystem, open API calls on the domain solutions, all of this being secure on there. But there's one more layer on top of this, which nobody's talked about yet, which is quite interesting. And this is really that decision to support and planning layer out here. One of the big benefits of bringing this all together is not just to think about the data and the geologist or the geophysicist thing accessing that data uh, across this. It's to think about how, as an organization, do you accelerate the field development planning process or accelerate exploration inside of here? Because all of the users are now managed and organized. All of the data is one place. Workflows are accelerated. You can think about how do I look at the whole end-to-end -end process and start to provide the visibility on side of here and start to accelerate the technology inside of here. And again, you're gonna do this in the browser. So I'm gonna give you one quick example inside of here. And it starts to think about, okay, I don't just wanna access the data, I wanna access the knowledge. So in this case, you're going out, you're doing exploration in uh, Australia, you're gonna to wanna to know what current knowledge is inside of the data ecosystem or inside of OSDU that is available for me. So we can start to think of it much more like Google or search inside of here. I'm not, no longer just looking for the data items on the map, I'm looking for the knowledge. What is the stratigraphy? What is the top reservoir? What is the petroleum system inside of here? How do I bring this together? How does it relate? How do all of these things come together inside of here so I can optimize my planning and bring all of the different knowledge together inside of here? 
You can then think about with tools like this, how do you interact with the data? Where are the lease arounds? Where the, where's the 2D data? Where's the information that I want to work in inside of here? You can build projects, set processes in this type of solution. And then ultimately, you can start to get visual analytics on top of what is your overall strategy and what is your overall status globally of everything you're doing. Because all of your data is in one place, I can now quickly say, okay, where are my prospects? Where are all the prospects that I have inside of an organization? How do I rank them? How do I understand the risk associated with each one of those uh, prospects and get that whole project management strategy around what am I doing across exploration, development, production, so I can shorten, get the visibility, and drive outcomes inside of, uh, inside of here. So just a quick summary. Uh, inside of here. So today we were building applications in uh, building domain applications, geology, geophysics applications. A lot of the way we built those applications was domain centric. Do a seismic inversion, interpret a horizon, build a model. And that was what geologists or geophysicists or geoscientists were very used to doing. Going off, being assigned a task, build that task inside of a big monolithic application. That is absolutely a valid workflow and is a critical workflow going forward. But increasingly, as we think about how do we work in the cloud, how do we liberate the data, how do we take full advantage of the high performance compute to be able to run multiple scenarios, multiple simulations, we can start to think about how do we build the next generation of applications, outcome-driven applications in a browser that are actually directing the geoscientists to focus on this look at this, this is where you're gonna get your challenge and should spend your time in, uh, inside of the application. So we're gonna to start to see this new generation of applications that complement the current applications uh, today. So to set up for the session this afternoon when we think about what is it that a geoscientist is gonna to need to think about in the future as they go first. So the first couple of things I think is, is important is they're gonna be mobile. Uh, today. I received my new PC about a year, year and a half ago. I've installed no petrotechnical software inside of it as well. Everything runs off the cloud. You can work in your office, at your home, on the beach at midnight at 7 a.m. Uh, this is the way the geoscientist of the future is going to work. I was in Indonesia last week. I pick up, I open my project, I run, the, my, run my presentation, I come, I do exactly the same thing here uh, today. They are going to be very data aware. When we built applications before, we built applications for the geologist, for the geophysicist. Increasingly, they have super access to all data at their fingertips, production data, drilling data, and they're gonna be very aware of the data that perhaps a previous generation weren't, do, weren't uh, in the past. They are gonna be multi-domain. You're not necessarily just going to be a geologist or a geophysicist. You're going to have to have awareness of these different domains. And as we saw yesterday, I believe increasingly people are going to be multi-industry. And as they work through their careers, they're going to change through uh, uh, different roles in different organizations as well. They're going to be collaborative. They're going to be much more familiar with sharing uh, information with their colleagues inside of here. And what we've seen is actually the way we build software today there's a much different collaboration between the software vendors and the EMP operators than there ever has been in the past as well to work together to start to solve the outcomes and the challenge. And they're gonna be outcome oriented. They're gonna be less focused on their individual task. They're gonna have much better visibility of the overall objective that the team is trying to achieve and working towards that common goal because you're all working in a shared environment and a shared platform. So I just want to finish, and this quote was actually used uh, yesterday as well, so I was very pleased to, uh, to use again. I did adapt it, quick uh, thing, so, uh, so I did take off the in the minds of men and just put in the mind. I think this is a much better quote to put it in, but I think it's really important that oil is found first in the mind. So everything we think about with digital transformation, this is not thinking about replacing the geoscientist is take, thinking about how do we enable the geoscientist? 
How do we give them the tools to have better visibility to the data, to run more scenarios, to think about the outcome, to understand the big project, to think about does this make sense geologically or geophysically or engineering wise? It's about enabling them to bring their geological geoscientist knowledge to the decision and make much more informed decisions. And with that, I'm going to end. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope it was interesting. <laughs>